Uh, this is China Painting 101. I'm Ann Cornick from Paint and Porcelain. And it's going to be a little longer session than we usually have. Um, I wanted to talk about teaching China painters to, you know, beginners to China paint. And I also want to encourage other people to paint along with us. And I think part of that is you need to have the basics. And you need to have them in one spot that you can go to that you can refer to them. If I go too fast for you, if you... Um, if you can't easily keep up with um, all the things that I'm telling you, I'm going to pop in my new website address. I just put it online. So if you need to follow this, or if you aren't, you're trying to take notes and keep up with me and you can't, if you just go to my new paint and porcelain site, uh, the website address is on here now, and there's a free printable. What you need to do in order to get the free printable is you go in as if you're going to buy it, but there's no charge. And you go through the checkout process, and when you do, you instantly, which is fabulous, you instantly get the printable. There's also a printable there um, that has to do with the with, um, uh, making a palette, too. So if you're interested in that, that's all there. So I have a little script to keep me on target today so that we can just keep moving through all of this. Um, the first thing I want to talk about are paints. Paints can be expensive. China painting in general can be expensive. And so what I'd like to do is... Um, give you my version of what I think a basic palette could look like to save you a little money. Now the pinks and the purples are the most expensive paints. And so I don't use a lot of pink. I use pompadour instead of pink. And so um, uh, you will see that I don't have any pink on my palette. Now the paints look like this. They're um, powder, they come in a little vial, usually with the cork stopper. And the cork stopper can be a real pain because it can come loose. So if you're gonna be storing these, you might wanna put them, like if, if they're not right by each other so that they're, the stopper can't open, you might wanna put them in a plastic bag if you're transporting them anywhere. So this is um, my first palette. Um, my mother was a China painter, so was my father. And my mother uh, had a beautiful set of uh, luncheon plates and I loved it. And I said, oh, I'd like a set like that. She says, you want a set like that? Paint them yourself. So <laughs> I went with her to the China paint classes and learned. And the palette, my palette's kind of well-worn, but it has these little clasps on the side that lock the lid on, which is nice. It keeps your paint very fresh. And the paints that I have in here that I think are a basic palette, and I wanted to show them to you, telling you about them is not the same as seeing the colors. Mixing yellow. Mixing yellow, unlike other some of the other yellows, will, will not fire out and will not... Um, they call it eating other colors, like it won't fade the colors around it. So mixing yellow, and you need a light and a dark of every color. Mixing yellow, yellow brown uh, is the dark version of that. Moss green, brown green, baby blue, and Copenhagen blue, which is nice. It's a, it's a gray kind of blue. Then I have ivory, finishing brown, uh, I'm sorry, rich, rich brown. Pompadour, which we will mix today so you can see how to mix paints. Blood Red, and Pompadour is the one I said I use as my pink. If you use it very sparingly, it's a pretty pink. Heliotrope and Pansy Purple, those are the most expensive. Uh, five, ten bucks at the cheapest for these paints. And then uh, White and Black. Now, if you were to get all those paints, I looked online, um, if they tend to run, I, I would think you could get them if you really shopped around. Uh, the two stores I go to the most often are Dallas China at DallasChina.com or Maryland China at MarylandChina.com. They carry paints. The other person who carries paints is a painter's collection. And that's all one word, a painter's collection.com. And um, they carry a lot of the old Ryan paints or Rins. You might have heard people refer to that. That used to be a big China company here in Detroit. And um, they have all of Agnes, Ryan, I called her Ryan, Agnes Ryan's um, paints and oils and all of that. So those are places where you can go for paints. And if you shop around, you're probably going to end up spending about $40 for just those paints. So that just gives you an idea of cost. The other thing you might want to do is pick a project, buy the paints you need for that project only. And, um, and then, you know, work from there. And if you have questions as we go along, please let me know. I hope I cover everything. So you may find that I'm covering it in a, a later section. I'll let you know. Um, there are other suggested colors on that sheet if you download it. 
um, that you might want to get in the future that I like, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily use it. If you join a club, um, a lot of times when they're, they have demonstrators come in, once we get past all this health um, issues, um, then you usually get a list of the paints you need and the kind of china you need and that kind of thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about supplies and of course palettes are the first. Now you can get a palette like this and if you do it has the, this is like a milk glass already on it so that I can just write the names. Can you see here? I uh, We're gonna have one of those days. Can you see here that I've written the names of each of my paints? And then that way I know what they are. You may think you'll remember, but as you get more and more paints, you really won't. And a lot of them look alike. So um, another way of making a cheap palette, something you can just start out with and see if you like. Um, I have a box here. Now, I don't know that they make these transparency boxes anymore. Last time I ordered transparencies, which are clear plastic sheets, I got them in um, an envelope. But if you can find a box, a candy box, like a uh, Sanders or Russell Stouffer or one of those candies, you could even use that. It doesn't matter what size it is. You can always cut things down to fit. And inside, what I have, I'll show you here. Okay. I have a piece of paper, and on this white piece of paper, I put a grid so that... I can put it behind my thin piece of plastic, which is a transparency. This is what they used to use for overheads. Um, if you can't find that, I think you can find clear plastic um, page protectors and just cut them and, and use those. And then you can take and put it underneath, the paper underneath the transparency and then write your names and put your, um, your paint right on it in the box. And then when you're done using it, you can just cover it up. And this gives you enough clearance. It doesn't look like it will. It's a very sh shallow box. But it'll give you enough clearance so that if you put your paints on there and they mound up a little bit, they won't touch the top of it. And this will at least get you started. Now, it won't. It's, it's not airtight like the regular palette is. But regular palettes, um, for a small one, a 5 by 8 you pay $10. And that's really, that's like this big, you know. And then the palette that I just showed you before, it's about the size of a piece of paper. You pay 20 for that. So I just want to give you an idea. Another thing you can do, a friend of mine gave me this and I thought it was really cool, her husband made it, is it has a tile. She just gave me a tile and she, he did a, a box that was routed out to cover it. But I suppose you could just um, take a box, cut off the sides and adhere the tile to it somehow glue it on the box and then just put the cover over it when you're done and you could use a tile just as easily um, and that might work for you too so those are two ideas that you can use for actually creating your own palette uh, you will need a palette knife and this is what a palette knife looks like I left that off the list but I mentioned it later so you will know you need a palette knife for mixing paints um, you will also need um, mineral oil. Now, there's two types of mineral oil that the people here in Michigan are talking about. One is just your normal everyday mineral oil. And this is the normal everyday mineral oil. Oops, let me turn it so you can see it a little better. You can buy this, as you see, I got this at CVS. You can get it at the drugstore, you can get it at the grocery store, okay? If you have a baby, you can use baby oil. And baby oil looks like this and it's mineral oil but it's refined mineral oil so you know you can get that and use that this is to mix your paints it's not to paint with although I've used it to paint with but it's very oily and I'll tell you if you're a beginner painter and you try to paint with your mineral oil everything's gonna run everything's gonna be kind of a mess um, it'll never um, dry at all so that when when you go to put it in the kiln as you're carrying it down the stairs it may may start to um, spread so you you really want to try to use um, mineral oil only for your mixing um, mineral spirits uh, you can use turpentine to clean your brush you can use mineral spirits most of my people say odorless mineral spirits is the best and I can't tell you the number of people who are allergic to the smell of turpentine 
And I always painted with turpentine, but now I don't. I paint with odorless mineral spirits because too many people have complained. Um, one thing I will tell you is make sure it doesn't say anything up here about strippies or stripping. I bought that kind one time and I made a big mistake. And you, it has a grit to it so that when you go to paint, your paint doesn't move smoothly. You, you just can't paint with it. It's, it's, it drags. It's, it's a mess and it doesn't fire well. So you want odorless mineral spirits and you don't want anything that has any kind of strippies or stripping capabilities in it. Um, a sanding sponge. You can also get a fine, fine, fine coat of uh, uh, fine uh, paper. Sanding paper, a very fine one, or get a sanding sponge. Now, the thing I like about the sponge is it's pliable. And if you're sanding where you have a lot of raised um, edges on it, like a fancy edge, fancy border, this will get in all the little grooves and everything. You have to sand before, after you fire. So if you fire a piece, you have to sand before you paint it again. It gets a, like a, a little bit of, almost feels like sand on top of it. It gets a little coating on top of it and this is just to get the coating off. Okay, um, paper towel. People like that blue paper towel, that stuff you buy to work on cars. I don't like it. It has, to me, at least the one I bought, has kind of a film to it so that as you clean your brushes, it kind of, kind of like that strippies. It, it puts a little something, a little coating on my brushes. I just don't care for it. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna take two sheets, fold them in half, fold them in half again. And that's what you use to put, let me show you here. So I have my tile and I'll put it like this under my tile, right by it so that when I mix my paints uh, or when I clean my brush, I can just dab it, you know, clean it off on, on the paper towel. So that's the paper towel for you. Uh, and paper towel is, is pretty, pretty cheap. Um, oh, another thing I should tell you about jars. If you're gonna get jars, you can find these anywhere. You can use baby food jars. They're the best because they're nice and wide. So if you have a nice wide brush, you can get it in a baby food jar. So if you have these handy somewhere, which I don't know if they still even use them, uh, use these. These are the best. Uh, this is my oil. This is my painting medium, and this is my mineral oil. I put marbles in there. One of the teachers in our group started doing that, and I put them in the bottom half. Can you see them in there? They're gunky. They, they, uh, the stuff that comes off the brush, the paint, sticks to the, um, sticks to the marbles, and it, it gives you a cleaner clean when you clean your brushes. The paint comes out much nicer. Brushes. You're going to need at least, I would say, three brushes minimum just to get started. Now, we talked about brushes, on, I think, last week on, on the Wednesday show. And um, if you're used to a certain type of brush, that's what you should probably keep with. So if you paint with a certain type of brush now, ideally that kind of a brush, if they make something that would work for china painting, is what you should use. There are basically two kinds. There's this kind, which has the metal at the base. And there's this kind, which uh, they sell and they call them China painting brushes on Dallas and Maryland China and, and paint and porcelain, I mean paint and porcelain, um, a painter's collection. Um, these are the usually made with sable or squirrel or, I mean, they're like real, real brush brush. These are usually synthetics. Uh, this is a scarf, and we talked about these, S-C-H-A-R-F-F. -F. They're nice. This is a huge one. You don't need this. This is uh, what I started out with, but that's because my teacher said, paint with the biggest brush you can, and I've learned since that it's probably not a good idea to do that. Um, you'll probably need a, a zero, 0 so let me show you what those are. That's like Mary's brush that I bought. This is her liner. Oops, so this is the liner. It's really itty, 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 bitty. There, you can see it. I'm against my hair. And this is another form of liner. And this liner is a long one. So see the difference? There's a long and a short one. The same thing with brushes. With China painting brushes, if you buy them, there are two versions. You can get the long version or you can get the shorter version. So you have to decide which one is easier for you to paint with. 
Now, my preference is to go, my personal preference is to go with the metal brushes, the ones with the metal at the bottom like this. And I'll tell you why. You see how that's already splayed out? It's already flat. It's easy to paint with. That's what you want. When you get these brushes, they are round when you first get them. And in order to get them splayed out like this, you need to take and put them in an oil, work the oil into them, and then put a paper towel around them and put them underneath your tile and let them set for about a week. And even then, as you use them, you're gonna to have to keep training them by using your finger like this when you press down on your tile. Let me get the tile here. Working from a different angle today, it's a little more difficult here. So you press down on your tile, you press down on your paper with your finger as you paint, because you know you dip it into your um, mineral spirits and then you put it on your tile and get the mineral spirits out, dip a little into the oil and then pat it once. That's what gets it to this. Okay? So, um, if you don't mind training it, or if you can find one that already has the training built into it, somebody's used it for a while, slightly used, those are, those are good brushes. And I would say go with those brushes if you can find them. Uh, otherwise, you may want to start with the metal. The other thing I want to show you is this is a, a brush I bought at um, uh, like uh, Joann's or Michael's. I don't know if you can see that, but it's already separating on the sides. Oh yeah, over here you can see. See, it's already separating on the sides. And um, it just, when you get them, they're kind of all um, glued together and you have to break the bristles apart. That's not the kind you want, okay? You do want to spend a little and get a, a, just a couple of nice brushes. Um, I would say I recommend like a four, an eight, and a 10. Um, one of the ladies that was painting the other day said a six is a good size. So uh, I prefer to buy a brush in person, but um, I know with these scarf brushes, I had used them at a seminar and that's how I knew they were good. You need a case to hold your paints. And um, I use the old Tupperware case. If you can find this one, it's a good one. Um, this is the Tupperware case that I use. And it has these little, little shelves that come out. And you can see the shelves are about as long as a bottle of, uh, or a vial of paint. And that keeps the little lids from coming off like we talked about before. So that, that is what I use. But you could use a shoebox, you know, who cares? Um, you're, you're probably gonna need to transport your paints from place to place. You can even use a pencil case. But like I said, they are, you know, if they're, if they're only like 14 paints and they're in this big container, they are gonna flake apart and fall apart and you're gonna have paint all over the place. The only thing that will get paint out is this stuff that I know of. It's called Totally Awesome. And it, uh, it's at the dollar store, it's a yellow liquid. You can get refills. If you spray it on, it'll get the paint off of you. I, honest to God, I, uh, I had uh, red paint all over me. The bile, the lid came off while I was mixing it, and I was covered. And that's the only stuff that got it out of my clothes. So if you need something to get it out, you can use that. Uh, you'll need a tile, six by six. That's a good size. You can use a four by four, but you know, if you're painting something and you don't want to spend your whole time cleaning your tile, this is a good size. Um, whatever tile you use, don't end up painting on it. It gets um, it gets paint and oil built up in the tile and on the bottom and stuff from you using it. And if you fire that, it's gonna smoke like crazy. I know, because I accidentally did it one time. Um, you're gonna need a Sharpie. We have the regular Sharpie. This is the Ultra Fine Point Sharpie. And um, there we go. And, and it's permanent ink. And this will fire out. So if you draw on your china with it, it will fire out. The other one that everybody here was raving about um, is this red one. And um, this red one is a Pilot Ultra Fine Point No Xylene Permanent Marker. And it's, it's nice. I don't know if you can see that. There you go. Oh, it's got glare on it. Well, anyway, there. Maybe that helps. 
Um, but I was using these and I used it for a while and started to dry out on me. So I went to the box of them that I bought and they were all dried out. So I don't know what the deal is with those. I'd say if you're going to buy them, buy them one at a time or buy them two at a time. Don't buy the whole box. Um, okay. For mineral oil, in order to mix your paints, a lot of people now use these dropper bottles. I have a little teeny tiny one. The bigger the hole, the more difficult it is to control the mineral oil. So this, I would say, is, is a good size for me because I and you can reload it. It's real easy to reload. I got these for my students when I was teaching at the high school. And they, they work very well, but you don't need this. If you have an eyedropper around the house, just an ordinary eyedropper, you could use that. Okay, and if you um, if you don't have either of those, don't go out and buy them. What you'll basically do, let's pretend that this is my mineral oil. You put your mineral oil in a jar like this, and you dip your palette knife in, and get a little on the end of the palette knife, and put it on your tile next to your paint, not in your paint, although initially you probably could drop a couple drops from the end of your palette knife onto your paint, and then you mix it up, and it'll work fine. I did that for years and years and years. Uh, it's just recently that I started using the dropper because I thought it worked a little better, and besides, I, the mineral oils kinda, you know, it gets all over you, but um, a wedge eraser is another item that you will need. Anybody have any questions? I don't want to just keep going down my list. I'm almost done. So if you do have questions, ask. But um, we're almost done. There are just two more items that we're going to talk about. The wedge eraser. This is what this looks like. Let me turn it so you can see it's really a wedge. And the other end has this little round thing. See, it's uh, like that. You can use both ends for wiping out on your china paints when you need to make highlights or you need to designate an end, something like that. Or you can use, if you can find the Pico Pay, you can use the Pico Pay. This is the Pico Pay. It's the fine, for fine work, but it, it, it's nice. It, it'll help you in a lot of situations where that wedge eraser is just too clumsy. The final list uh, item on my list of things that you probably need to have is a pen. Now, this can be a pen that you've used before for something else. It doesn't really matter. Uh, my pen looks like this. It's a metal one, and it adjusts to all sizes. Um, I've even used, where's my other one? I thought I had it here. Mm, I guess not. I have a lot of pens here. I'll show you. I've even used the bigger pens, like, um, like this. The, the secret is to have a good point on it. You can see on this one, maybe you can't, but they separate in the middle. If, they, if they're separated, if you turn it this way and you see that it's one, one side of it is higher than the other, then you know it's separated. If it's separated, you need a new um, point and the points just usually screw out. Oh, let, me, let me just unscrew this and you can see oh, the point just comes right out. This is the point. Yeah, it's really cute. See that? It's a, um, I use a 102, 102 point on mine. I, I read about it and it seems like this one works the best for me. And it has a really fine point, so I, I haven't had any problems writing my name since I got this. There are two kinds of china that you can get. You can get bisque, or you can, which is unglazed, or you can get the regular china that is glazed. This is what a bisque piece looks like. I've got several here to show you. This is a bisque ornament. I'm gonna bring it right up to the screen because you can see a little better. This one has a lot of little dots on this side of it. So you need to run your hand over bisque. It should be smooth. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't feel rough. And watch for these little dots or any inclusions, little black dots, because those will give you problems when you go to fire. You can get bisque in ornaments, eggs for uh, the holidays. You can get little figurines. This is a little figurine. Here's another, a little boy figurine that I like that I have. A little boy figurine. Oops, I'll bring them real close and then you can see the detail, I think. Yeah. And these are easier to paint. 
kids like to paint these too. So, I mean, if you want to have a child and you want to teach them to China paint, you can uh, get them some of these little bisque figurines. You can order them online and uh, you can paint them. Now, the only thing I will tell you about painting bisque is that it's very unforgiving. So if you paint this, if you paint this and you paint the center of it, with a rose, you better use a regular, regular leaded pencil will fire out when you fire. Uh, use a leaded pencil lightly, lightly, just sketch maybe a flower that you want to paint and then make sure you stick to what you want to do because if you make a mistake, this is porous. You have to basically use um, mineral spirits or turpentine, get it all off, let it dry and start over. So this is probably not the kind of piece to start on it's easier to start on these little little people and things like that, little figurines, because that then, um, you know, they're, they're easier to follow the lines. It's basically like those little plaster things you used to get as a kid and you just color them. Now, I will show you, I have two um, of the same jewelry here. And from a distance, I think you can see this one is the bisque. It's more yellow because it doesn't have the white glaze on top of it. This one is glazed, and um, if I bring it up and I go like this, uh, yeah, you can see the shine to it. If I do the same thing with this, there's no shine. So that's how you know the unglazed from the glazed. Okay, so now you're gonna pick out a piece of glazed um, china basically with all your china if you get a cup like this go around the rim with your fingers you can't have any chips check the handle make sure there are no cracks make sure it's not it, it's tight look on the bottom if there's a real black um if you buy this like at a second hand store and there's a real black insignia from a china company it may fire through look for dots like there are dots on the bottom of this, and I'm sure you can't see those, but if you can, there are little dots. See that little dot there? If it were up in here, where I'm gonna be painting, it might fire through. So you need to really look them over carefully because if there are dots or imperfections in the glaze, it's gonna cause problems with you when you go to paint this piece. Um, popular pieces are um, things like the um, picture frames. And you see there's a label here and you think, oh, that's the only label. You gotta check on the back. This somebody wrote on the back of this. You gotta get it all off. If you don't, you're gonna have a mess. It's either gonna burn in the kiln or it's gonna fire in. Um, I've always said you, you should really try to paint a, a pretty piece instead of a plain piece. And this is a good example. If I hold this close, you can see it a little better. There are little dots around the inside here, all, all the way around, and there's dots around the outside. And if you paint a rose, say right there, or a flower, then you can put paint these dots with um, an enamel, and then you could paint in this, this work, this cutout work, with just a color. Same thing with the sides. And it would give you a really, 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 really nice um, outcome with very little work. So look for pieces like this. And finally, um, this is a, a favorite of a lot of beginners, a lot of beginning um, China painting um, people. First of all, we always seem to start with wild roses, but we also seem to start on a tea tile. This is a tea tile. And a tea tile has a border on it. So when you get done painting this, you, you paint tint the border around it as you go and it really gives you a nice finished product. And sometimes they even have holes in the back so you can hang them on the wall. And you can get plates. You can, you know, you can get just about anything in China that you can get. You can get teapots, you can get soap dispensers. Um, and the more practical things are the things that, that really, um, that really um, make a difference as far as, um, you know, selling it at a, a sale or something. Now, when you mix your paints, um, to put them on your palette, you're gonna mix them on your tile. This is your tile. You're gonna tap out just what you need. I would say about pea size, like that. 
Make sure you put the cap on well. And then you're gonna take your mineral oil and you're gonna put just two drops if you have a dropper, or you're going to put your palette knife in and just get a little and put it on the side. And then you're gonna take your palette knife and mix it in. And you can see, I'll hold it up a little, there's still some dust over here, some of the paint that hasn't mixed in. And as I mix it in, it's not mixing in well, so that means I need to add maybe another drop. And as we said the other day, if you get it too oily, it's really hard because then you have to mix more powder into it. So what I would suggest is, if you get to the point where you're not sure if you need to add more, put a drop of paint off to the side, a drop of the oil off to the side, and then take a little on your palette knife and keep mixing it in. Now, you mix it in a swirly motion. Get all the powder out. If you don't, it's going to show up as dots on your piece. Then scrape it off and put it on your palette. Okay? And that's all there is to it. Then you're going to wipe off your knife. And I use keep tissue close by because I like to wipe off what I've just mixed because there may still be some powder in that. And if I use this tile to paint with, I could pull some of that pot, that powder into one of my other pieces that I'm painting with. So I, I try to avoid that. All right, so that's how you mix it for your palette. Now, there are two kinds of pen oils that, that I like um, and that I've talked to many teachers, and the teachers have said the same thing. And this is um, the Easy Flow. And uh, this is the drying pen oil, and these are both from Dallas, China. Now, I like the drying pen oil better, and the reason I do is because once I write my name I, and it dries, I don't have to worry about it. But you never know. So um, what, you, what you will do with this, it's a little bit different. You can either use freshly mixed paint. I would say don't use the gummy stuff that's been sitting a while. Or you can mix your paint. You can put powder down and add this oil to it just as you did, but with this oil um, to mix up your paint. I tend to take a little bit of the paint that I just mixed, put it on my palette, and then with this, I use a dropper because nothing else much fits in there. Or you can use the fat part of your knife and just turn it over a little bit uh, over in the you know, side of the paint that you have and get a little oil out but I like to be a little more accurate so I use my dropper and I just put a, a drop or two probably don't even need that much on the side next to my paint and then I use my palette knife and pull a little in and mix it in and you see it didn't even take all the let me show you it didn't even take all of the oil see oops there there's the oil so um, I only need it about that much, I think. And the way you judge it is if you scoop it off and lift it up and it drips. Eh, this isn't quite dripping, so let's just take a little more oil. Like this. Of course, I mean I'd have enough paint on there. This is a very small amount of paint, but let's see. Yeah, it'll drip. Then I'll put it down. And then I will take my pen, and I will load it. And I load my pen by just scooping it with the, oops, we're going to have oil dripping in a minute here. Let me just pick up the rest of this oil there. Um, I use it, the, the side of my pen, and I just scoop it like that. And then I always test it on my tile by writing my name. I need a little more. Maybe a little more. This tile's got a lot of gunk on it though. Sometimes you have to go slowly to get the paint to come off. And then once you know it's gonna work, you're all set, then you can try it on your piece. But test it first because 
and clean your pen when you're done with uh, mineral spirits and make sure you get that pen nub really clean so that none of the paint dries on there because then the next time you'll have a problem using it. Okay, so that's how you mix paint for your pen when you're doing pen work. Um, loading your brush. We're going to talk about loading your brush now. There are two different ways you can load your brush. I'm going to use a really big brush and a really bright color. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, I'm going to, first you always start by cleaning your brush. And what you do to clean your brush is, you're going to take and take your turpentine, tap it, really use your finger to squeak it out. And when you see no paint, it's clear on your towel, then you'll dip it into your oil. And like we said last week, you're only gonna dip maybe that, oh, sorry, maybe that much. I mean, just the very tip in the oil. And then for a side load, for a side load, we're just gonna go into the paint from the side and make a reverse C stroke. Or is that a C? That is a C. A C stroke. And then we're going to paint with that and that will kind of give you an automatic shading as you'll see here see it goes from light to dark automatically that is side load okay now i'm going to clean my brush my real well tap it against the side till you don't see any paint in the mineral mineral spirits clean it off put a little bit of oil on it pat it okay now full load a full load, you take and go straight across to your paint so that you're loading the whole brush. And then you're going to side load, usually with a darker color. Now, you'll see here how the colors look. A full load, it would just be a solid color all the way across. Let me just do a full load now. Of, let's do blue. This is a full load. Okay. So those are the two basic ways you can load your brush. All right. You're always going to, and this is difficult when you're painting china, you have a piece, you're always going to paint towards yourself. So if you're painting this part down here, you paint this way. Then if you want to paint the top part, you flip it around and paint towards yourself. You always paint towards yourself. And that takes a while to get used to. So if I were painting these leaves, I would paint towards myself down there, flip it around and finish the leaf. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of some of the techniques that you would need to know if you were starting china painting. My studies will come to you, they'll look like this. They'll have tools at the top, suggested colors, so you know what colors you need to buy. And then they'll have links. And the nice thing about this is it will link to the video where we did the tutorial, so that if it comes in a PDF format. So you just click on the link, it'll take you, um, if you have Facebook, it will take you right to Facebook. And you can look at the tutorial and you can paint along with the instructions. Um, I did the Forget Me Not one has uh, the plate has a plate that we that I did as well as jewelry. If you're interested in putting Forget Me Nots on jewelry, and it'll walk you through the first, the second fire, the third fire. It'll give you different ideas for backgrounds on the jewelry. And then it will also provide you with line drawings for, in this case, for two items. Usually it's just for one because it's a big item. And then it will show you what these items look like in their first and second fire. There are only two fires on this particular piece. So um, if you want to get studies, that's one way of just determining. And what you do is you take that line drawing and you can put a piece of tracing paper under it. I use the Sorel Wrap. I like that. It's a, a red transfer paper. It's wax-free. You just cut the piece that you need and um, 
you put the, the piece on your plate, you tape it to your plate first. So if this is your plate, you're gonna, you're gonna tape the red Sorrel wrap to this first, or Sorrel transfer paper to this first, tape it, and then cut out your line drawing and tape your line drawing on top of it. And then use a colored pen, something other than black, to trace the line drawing so you know where you left off. And that'll, that'll put it on. That's one way of transferring or having a design. You, you pick a design someone else did and you just, you can transfer it onto your work and then you can learn from that. And that's probably the best way to start out. But if you're good at writing and drawing, then you can also, um, you can also take um, a fine liner and just a little bit of whatever color paint you're going to be using and draw right on your china what you want to do. Most of the um, china studies that um, work the best either have like a C, which is this. This has a C kind of outline. You can also do them with an S outline. Um, and that usually works well for a piece just as far as composition goes. You, as long as you try to fill at least two thirds of the piece because you don't want to have a lot of dead space on there. Um, you can also just do it freehand, and um, if you do it freehand, you can use a Sharpie, which a lot of people do these days, although every once in a while, the Sharpie doesn't fire off the way you'd like it to. The other two pencils that we used to use in the olden days, we had this one, which is a graphite pencil, and we had this one, which you've probably seen. These are china markers, and we would sketch on with this, and this, these both fire off. So if you're on bisque, you can use just a regular uh, pencil. Pencil, pencil, graphite pencil, and it works real well. So um, a lot of people, when they're painting too and first starting out, like to mark where the light is going to be on their piece. So if you're painting this piece, you might want to, you know that the light is coming from above. You might want to put a little X where you want to make sure that you leave some white china so that you have a highlight on your leaves, you might want to put like on this one here, see how that one, you might want to put an X right there so that you remember to leave the um, open space so that it has a highlight or use a lighter color if you're using a lighter color for the highlight. But um, it's important that, that you do that because I think that makes a big difference if you're starting out, it's kind of hard. My granddaughter said the hardest thing for her was remembering where, where the light hit the flowers. And so uh, we developed that technique and it seemed to work for her. And that fires out, the, the little X's fire off. So you don't have to worry about them being there when you're on your second fire. Um, when you fire, uh, before you fire, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna take your plate and hold it up and really look across the top of it. Make sure that there's no oil buildup, there's no paint buildup, there's no um, brush, bristle brushes on there and dust. If there's a lot of dust, just take your brush and lightly, using the very end of the brush, lightly pull the paint with a little bit of oil on your brush. Just a little bit, really pat it pretty dry and just do that. And sometimes that will lift the, um, the dust. If you painted that side of the piece a long time ago, uh, you might be out of luck because if you do the technique with the brush, uh, you may have to start over and redo the whole side because sometimes the paint's so set up that it leaves all kinds of lines and it, it just doesn't work for you. But if it's a recently painted piece, you can usually get rid of the dust by just lightly brushing over it. Um, firing your piece, I use a jewelry kiln. Uh, the jewelry kiln holds about a 10 inch plate max, eight inches better. I can cram some things in there if I really try, but it's not always easy. Um, the thing I like about it, I have an even heat kiln, and it's um, uh, it's about uh, a 45 minute fire, and that's it, it's all done at that point. As far as medium, the kind of uh, paint medium that I like to use, I've used several in my lifetime. My mother has two, and I have a lot of hers. I have a medium plus, which they carry at Dallas, China now, I understand. And um, then we also have uh, Agnes Ryan's uh, painting medium that you can get through um, a painter's collection. So um, those are, are two options there. 
Okay, so make sure you fire your piece before you put it in the kiln. I mean, after it comes out of the kiln, before you start painting it again. When you're done painting, make sure you wash your hands because some of these paints, you don't know if you're getting the lead free or the, the paint with lead in it. You wanna make sure you wash your hands really well after you're done painting, that's important. A lot of China painters have gotten lead poisoning just from using paints that have a lot of lead in them. Now, this was a while ago. Paints nowadays don't have that lead in them. And um, finally, clubs. Uh, the World Organization of China Painters is the main organization. There's also an international one. It's called IPAT, International Painter, Porcelain Artists and Teachers. But the World Organization of China Painters in the U.S. is probably the largest organization. They're based out of, I think, Oklahoma. And they have a listing on their site, which is wocp.com, um, where you can go and you can find out state organizations. And then if, you, if your state has a, um, if your state has a, a local organizations and they, they have a website, it would be listed on there. If not, you could contact someone at the state organization and find out who the local organizations are. There's a listing of teachers on the WOCP website, but it's very incomplete. So check with your state organizations. Michigan's is called Michigan WOCP. And we have a website, it's michiganwocp.com. Um, a lot of um, the state organizations are also on Facebook and you can look them up that way. Um, another thing, if you want to learn to teach and you don't have a lot of teachers in your area, I would suggest as uh, we start going back to, to meetings and things of that sort that you consider going to a convention. If there's a convention in your area, um, they usually have workshops. Um, the other thing you might want to do is sign up for one of the China Painting Schools. Um, Indiana has one, Michigan has one. I'm sure there are other states that have them as well. And usually that's um, a week long and you get to pick a painter and you paint along with them and you learn a lot from them. And that's where I got a lot of my brushes and a lot of my paints. So um, I hope this has helped. This is everything I can think of that a beginner needs to know about China painting. Thanks for joining me. I hope you liked what you saw. And if you did, please like this page and also subscribe to it. And in addition, um, you can check out any of the products or studies that you saw at paintandporcelain.com or check the uh, description box below for information.